swimming wasn't my thing. And then once I found it, I suppose I progressed quite quickly. And I was competing by the time I was about eight or nine, and I did my first junior international at 11. Okay, um, here's my 11 Olympic Games. Um, they're all amazing. Every single Olympic Games has a real personality about them. I get asked which is my favorite. Of course, without doubt, that would be London 2012 which we did the most amazing job in, and I worked on the big team involved with that. But there's, obviously for me, Moscow, where I won my medal, is very, very special. Each Games has a real feel about it. For example, I think Sydney was the first time that we had a green Olympic Games, and we had Games Makers. Um, Rio looked amazing on the television, was absolute bedlam behind the scenes. Um, we had green swimming pools, if you remember that rightly, because they didn't manage to order the right chemicals. How can you not do that in the Olympic Games, order the right chemicals for a swimming pool? Really, what else? Montreal, I was only 13. A lot of it went above my head, but I thoroughly enjoyed being there. And there was no, no lottery funding like there is now. So all of the money to get me to these competitions, to supply kit, to go away racing, was coming out of mum and dad's pocket. And they were very normal folk. You know, my dad was in the Navy. My mum wasn't working when we were little, but then we went back to work in the local um, store on the high street. I think was House of Fraser. Stood just like hanging in there by our fingernails. Um, and yeah, but, you know, I had twin brothers and we didn't have a summer holiday from when I was 11 or 12 because all that money was being spent on my sport. So it was a, a team effort by everybody. First um, major international um, after the Olympics, which was a lot of experience, but I wasn't really expected to win medals, was the European Championships in 1977. This is a picture of me standing with two East German ladies. I always use the term ladies quite loosely when I talk about East Germans. <laughs> because they kind of were my maverick all the way through my sporting career, certainly my first sporting career. Um, we know now, obviously, that there was a, a doping, a national doping campaign. Um, to be fair, we knew at the time. It was really, really obvious. You know, they were really dominant in all the women's events. They would turn up and compete at major competitions we'd never seen them before. They would sound like men. They looked like men in lots of instances. They were incredibly strong. Um, and they, were, they totally dominated. Um, and in the two Olympic Games that I was in, they won every single medal, gold, silver, and bronze in all of the women's events as well from about five, of which I was one of them. So it was a, a sort of a great time for, for female sport, really. And the IOC turned a blind eye. In fact, they had an East German doctor sitting on the international doping panel. And every time they changed the rules, he would just go back and tell them how they changed the rules and they would adapt what they were doing. There was no out of season testing, so there was no, nobody going into East Germany and testing, and they were quite rudimentary tests. They weren't really very good, so they made sure that they would come off their testosterone just before they left the country. Surprisingly, it comes out of the system quite quickly, but actually the benefits don't, and they would test them all before they left, and as long as they were clear, they would send them. So it was, it was tough, it was very tough. I mean, for example, in Moscow, there were many Brits that came fourth and fifth behind three East Germans, you know, and. <laughs> Had they been no East Germans, they'd have been Olympic champion, you'd know who they are. But you have no idea who these people are because they were fourth behind three East Germans. So it was a very a very dark period of time. I was sort of alluding to was that I had to start to learn to deal with the British media. And the British media are quite challenging in this country. They're really good at building you up, but then they're wonderful at pulling your wings off when things don't go quite as, as well as you'd like them to go. So the, uh, the Olympic Games are coming. And I'm training six hours a day. As I said, I'm not getting any funding whatsoever. I'm going to a place called Kelly College so where I could do my studies as well as get up early in the morning and um, work with a, a very high level of group of training group. Um, and in 1979, um, Russia invaded Afghanistan. And Mrs. Thatcher decided, wouldn't it be really good if we turn around to all our athletes who have no funding whatsoever, who've trained really, really hard, with no financial reward whatsoever, to tell them to boycott the Olympic Games. And we had a period of of a few years where we had boycotts. In 1976, we'd had apartheid and that was boycotted. 1980, obviously, we had problems in 1984. Thank goodness, hopefully, those things are behind us, although every once in a while the politicians still try to use the Olympic Games as a political tool that asks people to, to make protests. Uh, and in my experience, it's the one thing that actually brings the world together, brilliantly, sport, as we know, and what's going on outside. So I was training very hard, not knowing whether I was actually gonna get to go to this Olympic Games or no. Now, swimmers, very rare if you get two Olympic Games. Sometimes you do, especially if you're a sprinter. But in my event, which is the 400 meters individual medley, you normally only get one Olympic Games to really shine. So here was me, training six hours a day, getting up at five o'clock in the morning, trying to do all my exams, making huge sacrifices socially, and not sure whether I was actually going to get to go to the Olympics. And at the end of 1979, I also got glandular fever. I didn't know I got glandular fever. And one of the things that my dad 
dad used to say to me was um, he'd set sets. So he'd say to me, we're going to do a set 10 times 100 meters freestyle and we're going to swim and rest inside of 80 seconds down and you're going to try and hold 65. And right at the end of that sentence, he would say, I know you probably can't do it, but give it a go. And it was the way that he used to make me kind of do it because I'd do it to prove him wrong. <laughs>